All right, good evening. This is the May 18th, 2022 meeting of the Oyster River Cooperative School Board. Our first item of business is the approval of the agenda. Brian? Motion to approve as presented. We have a motion from Brian and a second from second. Denise. Any changes? All those in favor of the agenda? Six in favor and the student rep in favor of the agenda is approved. Um, and the next item is public comments. Is there anybody here who would like to speak at public comment tonight? All right. And then the third item is the approval of the minutes. We have both um, regular and non-public minutes from March 4th. Move to approve the regular meeting minutes for May 4th. The regular meeting minutes? Regular meeting okay. minutes. Second from Brian. Changes? Yeah. I have, Denise. So I have about four tonight. Um, the first one is on page three under superintendent's report. It states senior Olivia Gass is the first Barrington student to graduate from Oyster River High School. I don't believe she's the first to graduate <laughs> from Oyster River High School. I wasn't, I couldn't, the, uh, I, the video wasn't uploaded yet, so I couldn't go back and see if somebody remembers exactly. Yeah, it's Olivia Gass is the first Barrington student as the student rep on the school board. Yeah. yeah. I sent that to Wendy this morning. Okay. So great minds, Denise. Yes. Um, and then the next one is under the kindergarten registration update, still in the same section. Um, I would like to add that Denise asked if Massway would be able to accommodate the increase in students without hiring another teacher. Mr. Lowe responded they might need to move faculty around. Dr. Moore stated if another teacher was needed, one would be hired. And then on page four, under the finance committee report, um, the first sentence where it says, report at their first meeting, they held a discussion with, it should be New Hampshire Electric Co-op to find out how their, I believe it should say electric bus program works. And then the last one is on page five. Um, where it talked about the switching, oh, school start time. Um, the board agreed to a discussion point. I would like it to say instead that uh, Matt inquired about switching start times to have the elementary schools start before the middle and high schools. Michael said, suggested there was enough interest in the board to include this as a discussion topic at a future meeting. That's it. Others? All right, um, all those in favor of approval of the May 4th minutes with those changes? Six in favor and the student rep in favor of the regular minutes are approved. And the non-public? Oh, I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the non-public meeting minutes on May 4th. We have a motion from Denise. Second well, from sir. Heather. Need discussion? All those in favor of the non-public minutes? Six in favor and the student rep in favor. Those are approved also. Um, announcements, commendations, and comments from the district? Good evening, Rebecca Noe, principal of Oyster River High School. I don't usually get to go first, so I was not ready. Um, so on May 13th, I received notification from NEASC, the New England Association of Schools and Colleges, and they're the Commission of Public Schools on our accreditation. So we completed a five-year progress report this winter, and the commission is continuing our accreditation. Um, they highlighted quite a few areas, but I picked out a few just to let you know what they were very pleased about in that report. And so the involvement of all of our stakeholders in the review and revision of core values, beliefs, and learn, uh, beliefs about learning and 21st century skills. Uh, regular review of instructional practices through collaboration, reflection, examination against best practices, and consistency with school beliefs. The use of targeted personalized learning strategies based on individual learning needs. The formal structure to establish regular education and special education teachers to collaborate and implement alternative approaches to learning and additional supports in the classroom. They reinforced our MTSS system in using data to inform school-wide response and intervention efforts. Um, increasing differentiation in the classroom, 
the addition of common planning time for staff collaboration, and the use of feedback to look at counseling, programming, and improving services. So there was about a full page of accommodations, but those are some highlights that I wanted to give you. And we will submit our next report by June 1st of 2023, and our decennial accreditation visit is in 2028. Um, any questions about that? Okay. Um, next, I just wanted to let you know we're very excited to report that Will Johnson and Dylan Labonte took part in the UNH Community Change Maker Challenge. And Dylan Labonte won, was awarded first place for his project entitled 120 Minute Movement. His idea emerged from his work this year in the Design Thinking Seminar pilot with John Bromley, and he hopes it's running again next year. We're thrilled for Dylan and the work he's done this year, and it's a testament to who Dylan is becoming as a person, and a testament to the design thinking course, which engages students in their unique interests, passions, and skills as they seek to make a contribution to a problem that they identify. So we're just very proud of both of those young men going to the Change Maker Challenge. Okay. Any questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. Others from the district? No. Nope. From the board? Brian. Uh, I was lucky enough on May 6th uh, to join Dr. Morse in welcoming uh, Senator Shaheen here uh, to the middle school for a tour. The sixth grade um, team did a really, really good job because the people that normally do it were actually out that day. So uh, they had a lot of fill in, so it's a little rough getting it started. But um, started outside, walked through the whole building, very impressed. Um, we got to have a little conversation with her afterwards about the future of education and things like that. But she was uh, um, glad she was able to take the time to do that since she's, even though she lives here, she doesn't get a lot of free time to come and visit uh, their district during the week, so or any place in her in her district. So uh, it was really good. It was nice to, the, for Dr. Morse to host her, and um, we actually made some inroads with her staff to hopefully promote the middle school in the future. So worked out well. I'm glad you could come. Thank, I thank you very much. Thanks, Brian. Others? You see? On May 12th, the State Board of Education met at the Oyster River Middle School. In addition to that meeting, there were um, community members uh, from our community and in New Hampshire who showed up wearing red for ed, supporting our public schools and our students. So wanted to, um, to thank the community for caring in that way. Bye, everyone. Denise. I just remembered the, the play, the high school. I did get to go see the high school play, Your Good Man, Charlie Brown. It was very well done. And congratulations to all the students. It was nice to have an in-person play again. All right. So I should have noted at the beginning that um, Assistant Superintendent Suzanne Philippone is playing double duty tonight. Dr. Morse is traveling and obviously not with us here. So um, we are very fortunate tonight to have a whole bunch of special guests. I'm really excited about this tonight. And do you, would you like to introduce them? Or? Sure. Um, Michael Hawley is here with the high school FIRST Robotics. And we also have John Silverio, who is here with the middle school VEX Robotics teams. And so I believe the middle school is going to be coming up first to talk a little bit about their season and their robot. Just want to thank Suzanne for allowing this to happen, give us the, the, the floor to be able to talk about our program. Um, eight years ago, I was fortunate enough, uh, Jay Richard allowed me to move from my fifth and sixth grade years, 20 years of teaching fifth and sixth grade, to take over the STEM seventh and eighth grade program. One of the conditions was he wanted to see the robotics program come back. So Jason Duff and I teamed up. Jason and I, you know, we've been friends for years, and uh, we decided that you know, we could do it. And we started with FLL, which is First Lego League, and that was eight years ago. We did it for a few years. Excellent, well-respected program, but what we found was our numbers were increasing so much, we couldn't accommodate the interest of the students because it was too costly. And the way it's, the, the program is structured, it, um, we just kind of had a phase out of it. So fortunately, somebody in the robotic circles recommended the VEX IQ program through the REC Foundation. So at that point, we transitioned from FLL to uh, the VEX IQ program. And what it's allowed us to do is offer to more kids. 
because we can um, have smaller group size, anywhere between three and five students. So last year, you know, Jason's going to go over some of the numbers and so forth, but last year, this particular year, the school year, we had 56 students come out for the program. And we've had, we've been in the 50s before. Last year, because of, you know, the pandemic, we had to do an in-house program, it was a bit smaller. So we ended up with 15 teams to start the year off. And the three, we have representation from three of the teams that went to Worlds this uh, couple weeks ago. They were in Dallas, Texas, competing. And uh, again, Jason's going to talk more about that. But we're very fortunate to have VEX. It's more affordable. And again, it allows us to offer it to more students. So right now, we offer it to 6th, 7th, and 8th graders. And this summer, I'm also doing the REACH program, five weeks of uh, robotics. And all the camp weeks are uh, filled up. But behind us, <clears throat> all the, all the folks the students, high schoolers behind us, all products of the middle school program. And I know they've seen an increase at the high school in the participation, and, and that's what we want to see. Just like an athletic team, the more you get the students, the athletes playing at the younger levels, it's just going to benefit the high school. Um, I, want to, I want to point out Annika. Annika, wave back there. Annika and her friend Jaslyn came in and volunteered throughout the season, and I'll tell you, they put on one of the best um, presentations, instructional presentations that I plan to use down the road. It was so well done. But it's people like that that give back to the program that we really need to recognize because in the future, they'll hopefully be doing the same and following that, giving back. So in the future, right now, one of the greatest things is to move into this middle school because as you probably saw on your tour, there's a robotics room, a robotics center, and right outside between my STEM classroom and the eighth, seventh and eighth grade art room is a big common space, plus my STEM classroom. So we can just spread out. We got plenty of storage for all the, uh, the supplies. The key, and once the robots get built, so it's been an incredible opportunity to move into this space and then begin next year uh, just running. So uh, Jason Duff, my partner here, he's going to talk a little bit too. So I don't want to pat myself or John on the back, but I just want to kind of explain the success of our middle school program and kind of, I, I went through the numbers this week and I was kind of shocked myself. Um, and I just want to recognize, it's really the efforts of the kids, their accomplishments um, is pretty tremendous. Um, so we started VEX 2017, so that was, um, that was fall of 2017, so the, that was with the group that's current seniors at our high school. Um, we've, since then we've had 10 to 15 teams per year. Um, we didn't compete for one of the years, so four competition years. Um, we've competed in 22 weekend events. All right, which includes um, three world championship events, one of which several of the kids back there were qualified for world championships that was canceled um, in, in, the 20, uh, in 2021. So we went, went to three world championships. So not including worlds, because we haven't won an award yet at worlds, we've competed in 19 events um, during the weekends. Um, we've received awards at 18 of them. The only one we didn't was our very first event ever. Um, we are, we've become the, you know, the dominant robotics program in all of Vermont, New Hampshire, and possibly all of New England. The, in those 18 events, we've earned 49 awards. Um, we've been the top honors in all of New Hampshire and Vermont. Um, all four years we've competed at that event. Um, let's see. This last state championship, this current year, with the group that's here, there were 24 teams in, this, um, in all of New Hampshire, Vermont, invited to the event. Six of those teams were from Oyster River, so 25% of the teams invited um, that had to, or had to compete to qualify for the event um, were from Oyster River. There were 11 awards presented at that event, six of which were taken from our Oyster River teams, three different teams during those 11, event, those, um, 11 awards. Um, so I just want to say that the kids have done all the work. John and I provide time, space, and materials. Um, occasionally some knowledge, but quickly we find that they know more than we do. But um, and, uh, you know, we've had a lot of support. Mr. Richard's been amazing. Um, you know, the school district, the community, the parents, to make the whole thing happen. We see the high school program building, and we hope 
that they continue to be given that space, time, materials, so that that success, um, when we have nearly you know, 8 to 10 percent of the school building want, wanting to do robotics, it's a big thing. It's as popular as any sport in the building. Kids are interested in it. Kids in our classes ask us every day how our robotics teams do in any event. It's, it's a really um, impressive thing that uh, the whole school and these kids should be especially very proud of. Yeah. And before, um, a couple years ago, we actually ran a couple really successful events at the old middle school. In this new middle school, we're really hoping to maybe even do the state tournament here. So we're looking, uh, you know, maybe the high school could also use it. just set up perfectly for a VEX IQ and I'm sure a first event. So it should be an exciting future. You guys want to see what we got here? We brought, we brought a robot to give an example of what our robots were. And you'll see there's a dramatic difference between the high school robots and middle school robots soon. You guys, I'm not sure where everyone can see it here. You want to bring it out of here so they can do it? We can get up and move around too if, it, All right. if it's. Uh, yeah, yeah. The object of this year is they had to pick up, there were 22 balls placed throughout um, on a field. They had to be able to pick up the balls um, and put them in different scoring zones, one of which was a, a high goal that they had to be able to throw the balls into. Um, they have one minute to complete the task. So it's a very short task. Um, this particular robot, um, was roughly 50% better than any other robot at the state competition. That's had the, um, the juice their rotation and the elastics. Uh, by the end of the season, most. Really? There's a lot of copying, yeah. but it's a, it's a lot of refining, right? You guys would say that? Yeah. I'd say all three of the robots we brought to Worlds had a very similar shape, right? At Worlds? In At Worlds, um, from the well, the lay person wouldn't see a visual difference between this robot and the best robot on the planet. So there, there is a difference, yeah. obviously. But yeah, they, there is a lot of, um, you know, there's, they, they copy each other. Um, and they get ideas, and that's just kind of how the, the world, the engineering world works. Um, but the, uh, it takes a lot to master it and to get it work. There's programming, there's sensors that are being run in, that, in the vehicle. Um, and if they go everywhere that they program their controllers, because they also have autonomous ones where they're not using the controller at all, so let's work on them. Did they name it? Do you guys have a name for your robot? Uh, Bob Catapulter. Yeah, they're the, they're the Bob Catapulters. <laughs> <laughs> So one of the really neat features of the VEX IQ program uh, is that these competitions, the, the major competition competitive aspect of it is teamwork challenge. And what happens is you're on the table, on the competition table with another team. And you don't work against each other, you work with each other. So that's the really awesome feature about this because it promotes collaboration. So I'm going to have Eli come up. He, he competed with the team on the same table from Turkey. And uh, maybe you can give you some insight in how they collaborated beforehand. So we were paired with a team from Turkey, and it was really hard because they didn't really speak much English. So it was kind of a lot of hand gestures and kind of moving around. And at one point, I was talk I was trying to tell him to come over to one side, and he just kind of nodded yes and stayed where he was. <laughs> Um, but it was really cool being paired with a team from another country and we were paired with other teams from different states. We were paired with a team from Hawaii, from Michigan, from Florida, and even one from Canada. And that was a really cool experience being able to be competing with and against teams from other places. So James, the, the, the students had, the teams that went to Worlds had to write a short biography about their team. And James put together a really great one for his team with the insight from his teammates. But one of the things he really focused on is how he trans, I don't know, translated or transformed what he did with these boys on the soccer field, his teammates, and how it, you know, moved into the robotics. And talk about that, James. Um, so basically, we met we met all of each other from soccer. We were all on like the same soccer team, and um, when we 
first started robotics, we all saw each other and knew that we were all going to be like on the same team. So from we from the soccer field, we learned how to like work together as a team, and that helped us build the robot and like drive it. So James, were you, when you guys started the season, were you do you have any plan on competing? No. We give teams a choice if they want to come and just build robots and learn stuff, or if they want to actually compete. Your team had no desire to, did you? No, we didn't. Uh, worlds. Yeah, worlds. <laughs> it took us a while to build this massive robot. It, it wasn't like, ooh, one day, hmm, I'll just think of this robot and let's go, I built it. No, it took like a few months of hard work and trial and error. It wasn't that easy as, oh, oh, I'll just look up someone on the internet and that'll work. No, we looked at so many people on the internet and decided trial and error was better than <clears throat> copying. So after I got a main design, we modified it more and more, got a high hang and the catapult working. It was kind of crucial to get a catapult that was quick enough but also powerful enough to shoot the balls. And at the very start of the year, we didn't have a cowboy at all. We only had a spinner, this little thing here. The cowboy took us like two months to build, but it was worth it at Nationals. Now, we have a team of uh, all girls, and one, one's not here, but they, they were the epitome of the engineering process and actually were recognized um, for such at, at the state, state competition and actually um, received they, had, they were here twice but the world for that, for that uh, reason. So the, um, they have an engineering notebook, journal, documents every single thing they thought of, did, every meeting, not unlike the meeting you have, where they set an agenda for what they're going to accomplish that day. They draw, you know, data tables and time trials and they document different things and they plan and drawings and sketches and they build three entire notebooks of just their ideas in the season. Um, and it was quite remarkable if it, um, in the uh, sixth graders that have plans to go back to worlds over and over again. So what do you want how what do you say about your uh, so this was our first year doing the VEX program, so we had we learned a lot. In the beginning of the year, our robot couldn't even drive forward, so we had to rebuild our robot a bunch of times and go through the engineering design process over and over again. How many robots do you guys think you built this year? Five or six. <laughs> Five or six. <laughs> <laughs> the last one was how soon before we um, Wait, like three, three days. days. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in three days. I don't know. <laughs> they were still kind of building it. Yeah. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very if you, yeah, please go ahead if you want to speak. Zach, if you have something you want to add. Thank you very much. We really appreciate you coming tonight. Very cool. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yes. I did have a question for the VEX folks. How long do you have your challenges before competition? Do you get them at the beginning of so the year? We got the challenge was released the last day of the world event, so that was so next year uh, eight days ago. And half these kids are already um, picked out of Jones Robotics room because they're already fast working on it. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, my name is Michael Hawley. I'm the uh, lead mentor of the high school first robotics program. And uh, why I'm kind of motivated to do this is to see all the success that they've had at the, uh, at the middle school level and, and to help bring it forward here. Uh, but I'm not going to talk too much because it's really all about these guys who uh, proactively on their own put together a whole presentation for you guys. So I'll let you guys introduce yourself. So I'm Saki Kandipudi, um, technical leader of the Oyster River 
Overdrive uh, first revised team. Is it possible to get that? Oh, thanks. So, much like the first, um, the VEX program, we build robots and um, compete with them cooperatively with other teams. So we're just here to let you know how FIRST is different from the VEX teams and um, some of the benefits of FIRST and what we've done throughout the year. So what is the FIRST robotics competition? So we build industrial sized robots, as you can see. This thing weighs almost 140 pounds and we compete with them cooperatively with um, teams around the state and around the region of New England. So these competitions are internationally recognized and also extremely cost intensive, which is why FIRST has dedicated a whole business aspect where students are pushed to find corporate fundraising, community partners, as well as fundraise for ourselves, since the cost to build this robot and registration is so high. And through that, we've learned essential leadership skills, communi communication skills, as well as um, many more attributes that let us be successful members of the community and prepare us in the future. As well as business and bu building these robots and competing with them, FIRST promotes STEM excellence within the community around them, and it's our job to out to build to reach out to younger students as such as the next team in our community and promote STEM. So we do this through the Cody and Coco events and also helping the VEX teams with their um, season. And we plan to do more of this throughout the future. And that's such a huge aspect of FIRST, which gives us volunteer hours and lets us contribute back to the community. So what is the impact of all these attributes of FIRST and the competition that we do? Well, 95% of FIRST alumni found that they felt increased leadership skills, as well as the first year after they did first, they wanted to do better in school and get better grades in, in, science, in classes such as science, math, LA, and more. As well as this, 92% of first alumni commit to four-year colleges, especially within STEM fields, and there's over $80 million in scholarship available to first alumni to help them throughout their college years. And so these are just some of the impacts of FIRST up on the board, and there's so many that prepare us to be successful members of society as well as successful engineers. And so we'll... Uh, Hello, everyone. My name is Will, and I am Oyster River Overdrive's team strategist and drive team leader. And I'm just going to give you a quick overview of our competition for this year. So FRC's 2022 season was called Rapid React, and Rapid React was a fast-paced game that favored highly agile and highly precise robots. This game is big, and it's complex, and it requires teams to create highly efficient offensive and defensive strategies to score the most amount of points in a given match. Points are scored by scoring cargo, also known as like nine inch tennis balls, they're pretty big, uh, and the upper and lower hubs as you can see on screen. Uh, and then at the end of the match, traverse up four inclined monkey bars and hang on the top one which is eight feet off the ground. It is this game that uh, helped us get outside of our comfort zones almost and build this robot as this is our first year ever competing in FRC and it was really a big leap and a big step for us to get to where we are and I'm really proud of the, uh, where we've come and where we are now. So for this competition we had six weeks to build our robot. Uh, we designed it, we built it, uh, we programmed it as well and we did all this uh, to compete in our competition. So we started with our steel and aluminum chassis, which holds all the electrical components, uh, as well as the sensors, which go to a program uh, that we wrote in Java that uh, controls the robot and communicates with the driver station and allows us to precisely control the robot and compete in the game. So we also have an intaking mechanism, which helps us score the balls that are involved in this game that Will talked about the nine inch tennis balls, we intake them through our mechanism and we lift them with our arm about three feet into the air and we dump them into the hub to score points. And finally, we have our lift that allows us to climb the monkey bars that Will was talking about. And this uses three different linear actuators along with some winches to climb these bars and score even more points to allow our robot to compete and do pretty well in the competitions, as you'll see because we have some accomplishments with our team. Our biggest accomplishment, or one of our accomplishments, I'll say, is our robot, obviously. We built this, we programmed this, we designed this, and we did a lot to make this ready for competition. And during these competitions, we worked with other teams 
Uh, as we were saying, we cooperated with other teams and worked together. And we were able to make it to the playoffs in one of our competitions, which is a pretty impressive thing to do for a team of our uh, size and of our age. Because first is based a lot on s these team sizes with all this money and things like that. Uh, there are teams that are with up to 100 people on them and many more mentors. So our team has around 20 people, and we were able to make to the playoffs, which is a pretty good thing for us. We also did a lot of fundraising, which is a pretty big accomplishment for us. We raised $3,500 through um, community outreach and crowdfunding pro uh, processes. And we also got some grants from the Department of Education because we are a new FIRST Robotics team, and FIRST Robotics is a pretty expensive thing to do. Uh, we also have some future goals because we were also qualified for a 501c3, which allows us to collect uh, sponsorship money from businesses in the community and worldwide that promote STEM, which will really help us elevate our program. Uh, but our biggest accomplishment, I'd say, is our learning. We learned a lot about STEM, obviously our engineering design process, programming, building, all these things like that. But we also learned about teamwork and leadership, which will help us uh, in the world and be successful people and engineers in the future. Um, hi, I'm Annika. There we go. Hi, I'm Annika. Um, I'm the software lead, and I'm just going to be talking about a little bit about what we learned. So through FIRST, we learned so many things, um, STEM skills included, like CAD, which is computer-aided design. We learned to code in Java, and we learned proper and safe usage of tools. Now, FIRST also teaches so many skills that are useful in the real world, like problem solving, communication with others, and learning to learn, looking at resources, and finding things out for yourselves. Now, these skills that we learn, a lot of them translate. So, for example, um, the software team, we code the robot in Java. A lot of the skills we learn directly translate to the advanced programming with Java course that the high school offers. Things like syntax, um, making sure the computer understands what we're doing, object-oriented programming when we program our subsystems and commands, and logic when we use different operators to compare information. We have also done some community outreach as a first team. Um, we participated in the Coding in Cocoa event, um, where we just showcased and talked a little bit about our robot. Um, we are probably going to be, we're going to be doing an expo at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard um, where we're going to show our robot and show it to other teams as well. And then upcoming Durham Day, we're going to be showing our robot, presenting it there. And then, of course, also helping out the Vex IQ teams at the middle school. So with all of our success this year, we want, we have huge aspirations for the future, and this includes increased outreach. As since we did some outreach, such as coding Coco and helping the vaccines, we want to do even more, such as hosting um, the region's F FTC competition, which is a younger version of FIRST, as well as more awareness demos and um, workshops with the middle schoolers and elementary schoolers to get them interested in the FRC program. And we also want to build community partners and corporate sponsorships, which we're in the process of doing since we just got our 501c, and have even more success and maybe even make it to the world competitions, just like in VEX in the FRC competitions. And also creating a lasting legacy and structure, because within the um, New Hampshire state, since it's, the first, it's like where it first started, there's teams that are over 20 years old who have deep ties in the community, and we want to be one of those teams in the future. So we want to transfer our knowledge and skills every year and create new engineers and successful members of society through our program every year that we operate and make sure that we're lasting within the next 20 to 40 years. And that's our mission as first and we just wanted to thank you for your time and welcome any questions now about the robot or any other aspects of our program. Thank you very much. Questions? I had a question. Um, where did you machine the, um, the parts for the robot? And can you talk through the, the middle school with its modular pieces is mm -hmm. able to recombine, as we heard some of the teams did um, quite successfully. Uh, how were you, since you're not able to, you, you don't have un unlimited parts um, or the time to, um, to create them again, how did you go through that iterative process? Yeah, so a lot of it started with planning before the season even started. Even though we're not given the object of the game, we know generally like the robot needs these pieces and 
um, how how mechanical stuff works. So we planned by ordering part lists before parts before even the competition started. And once the competition started, we used like design processes using CAD to visualize the whole robot. We had the whole robot on CAD before we even made it. So that way we can use like stuff like CNC mills and um, other like machines to put the just basically put together the robot once we have it all designed out and done the math out. Like we did a lot of the physics just using CAD software, which is a huge tool in the, um, in the industry of STEM. So yeah, we have six weeks, but we can make it work by using tools that real engineers use, which is how the world is so efficient. So we're, we're adopting those um, programs in our um, year ourselves. So just out of curiosity, what CAD program are you using? Uh, we're using Fusion Inventor, which is part of AutoCAD, the AutoCAD software. Yeah, so and then the CNC, you hired that out? Yeah, so we partnered with a company called iWorks in Dover. They're a biomedical company who has some CNC mills, and we had a contact with them. So they were a great help to us, and we would just give our contact there, um, Ashish Moy, our CAD files, and he would go print out the parts, or 3D print or cut from polycarb or the metal. Yeah, so they're like the first community partner we built, and pretty early on, before we even got 501C. What's one thing that would make next year even better? Um, well, we have a great space in the Oyster River JIT um, stage, and it's a great space, so maybe uh, just a little bigger space to work with since we have huge um, machines and trying to expand, but that's pretty much it. We've had a great year so far, and we believe we can work with any resources we have and greater, have an even greater year next year. Can I ask, answer that question a little bit too? <laughs> uh, um, no, seriously, just from a school board or administrative perspective, um, first of all, I'd like to thank Principal Noe. She's been very supportive of this. Also, the janitorial service. <laughs> we're here late night sometimes. Uh, they've been good. Uh, but I did want to kind of acknowledge that we're in this, this, this group is in a little bit of a weird space. It's, it's more than an after school club. Uh, that can meet once once a week or something like that. Um, it's not a sports team though, or it's not classified as a sports team. So, but we're we're kind of operating like that. So, um, we've been talking with Principal Noe about what other mechanisms can we have that would get us a better connection with the school. Um, to be able to do field trips that are recognized by the school. Maybe there's some resources or funding. Uh, the space might, we'll, we'll, we're working on that. Recognition for the students, uh, that type of thing. So um, if anybody has any creative ideas or if the principal is talking to you about that, that, that's really what we're looking for is to try to find our niche and our spot uh, administratively which is with the school. Because we don't have a faculty person. This is all volunteer and parent led at this point. Um, and so how we can find, because it's more than what a faculty member can do in a club kind of environment and framework that exists today. So um, we're trying to be creative and keep pushing while uh, uh, at the same time. So I hope that makes sense. So thank you guys all for the time here. I really appreciate it. Good yeah, time. thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Congratulations on a great first season. Thank you. Thank you. appreciate the teams, coaches, and parents coming out tonight, bringing, uh, bringing robots to share and your success stories. Moving on with our agenda for this evening, uh, I think we'll continue. I don't know if there's anything else with the assistant superintendent's report, but we'll continue with the superintendent's uh, report. I believe Catherine Floyd wanted to come forward and just um, report on COVID numbers. So we've been, um, obviously, as you know, through our pretty regular communication, we're seeing an, an uptick in our COVID numbers. Um, I anticipated an uptick, I think, to this degree, did not. But certainly, without having other mitigation measures that we're able to access in terms of universal masking, not just in school, but across sort of all um, avenues. So it, it's you can't just do one mitigation in a school 
measure in a school and hope that it's going to bring a trend down. It has to be universal everywhere. So um, we, you know, been communicating the numbers so families can make choices about what's best for them. Um, but it's also uh, realistic here that we're not really treating this as a healthcare crisis and we haven't been for some time. So we're not able to really um, take a really strong approach without the support of everywhere else outside of school. So the where, uh, where we are right now is at Massway, we had um, 34 positives as of today. That includes um, eight faculty, staff, and 26 uh, students. And we have 53 in quarantine. Uh, Moharimit, we had 33 positive. Uh, seven faculty and staff and 24 students, uh, 34 in quarantine. At the middle school, we have 41. Um, that number has come down from a high of 54. Um, well, actually more than 54, it was, it was 64. But um, we have seven faculty and staff and 34 students. We had 54 students when I was referring to that number has come down, that was a big spike. Um, we have 43 in quarantine. And at the high school, our biggest number, of course, is 74 positives as of today, 11 faculty and staff and 63 students, 74 in quarantine. So um, we also have eight district staff who are currently positive and nine in quarantine. And when I say district staff, it's pretty much everyone not attached to a school building. So that includes transportation, our SAU office, um, the facilities building, which includes IT and nutrition and that kind of stuff. Um, some questions that might come up is why are there more in quarantine at elementary levels than, than higher um, greater, uh, uh, upper grade levels? Primarily it's because um, less vaccinations at the younger ages. So of course if you're unvaccinated you are put out in quarantine for a longer period of time than if you are vaccinated where you can actually still access the school environment if you're exposed. Um, so we're working hard. I, I'm. I am so impressed with what the principals have been able to do to keep the doors open, as well as Lisa Hoppy with how we're coordinating transportation. We have had to cancel a few runs um, and working with families on that, and they have been amazing. But we are literally um, crawling to the finish line here, and I, I say that with the utmost respect for what's going on in the buildings. The faculty are covering for each other. They are giving up their time. Um, to cover for their colleagues who are ill. Um, they're covering recess and duties and everybody is pitching in. And uh, we can't do this forever. Uh, that's, I just wanna make sure that everyone understands that. Like this is, this is a lot right now, but I think we can make it till the end of the year. Um, you know, there still is the healthcare crisis in the hospitals that still is very real. Um, unfortunately, our family had to experience a little bit of a healthcare crisis where we tried to access healthcare and we couldn't um, in a timely manner. That was due to uh, full emergency rooms and, and not access to the right kind of care that's needed. There are not enough techs available to do appropriate testing and things like that. So it's still really real. It's, um, it, it's not like it's changed much in terms of being able to access care. So I think that's just, I, I share that just for us to be mindful of the fact that we still are in a healthcare crisis and we're still working really hard to do what we can to minimize the impact. Any questions? You see? Just had a uh, question, I guess, about, um, about messaging and how we message this. With the dashboard that we have, um, if the governor had not mandated that, uh, or had the executive order that um, said that boards couldn't mandate universal masking, would we be in a universal masking, um, or would we be in a, in a required masking state? So if we were able to continue with the mitigation plan that you all supported, then yes, we would be in the red and we would be in universal masking, but we're not able to do that. And at this point, again, I'm not sure if we only universally masked in our schoolhouses, if that would really bring the spike down. Okay. Because everything is open. There's concerts, there's professional sports, there, you know, everything else is open, so I, I'm not convinced it would bring the trend down. I think this is sort of where we are and we're trying to manage this, this piece of it. But yes, if the governor hadn't done that, our plan would have put us in the red and we'd be masking.
I just wonder about the messaging that goes out to the to the community and whether it should be a, um, just a little bit um, stronger. You know, you mentioned so that families can make the choices that are best for them. Yeah. The risk that I choose for my child um, now is different than if I were part of a of a bigger um, effort towards keeping schools open and. Um, you know, and, and, and stopping that community spread. So is it I'm just making the choice for most benefit for my child or am I part of something bigger? And I think for a part of the pandemic, we were able to make that um, appeal to something bigger and to act on that here. And now that we're not able to act on it, can we still put out the, 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 the message that is more than make the choice that's right for your child? And instead, is closer to can we all pull together to um, take some of the pressure off our, our 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 staff and faculty and keep kids in school, which is the intent from the start. Yeah, I think it's a it's a delicate dance. In yes. all honesty, um, what we don't want to do is to message something in a way that then brings um, a complaint towards a district. I mean, we are managing all we can at this point. If we get a complaint. Um, that's brought to the commissioner or the governor, we then have to handle that. So our messaging is really educational in nature, like here's where we're at, here's our numbers. We are going to support masking. We've seen increased masking, absolutely. Um, we are have staff and faculty who are switching um, their mask types and things like that's still happening. But we were never in a position where we universally masked, we short-term unmasked and went back. Like we were a district who was always universal masking because we used the data to make the decisions. So the back and forth is, is, is kind of tricky because we never had to do that. Um, our, our kind of point of messaging frequently is just to remind people of, yes, we're still seeing an uptick tick, and you know here's the mitigation measures we have in place and you're going to have to make the decision that's best for you, but we want you to understand where we're at. Um, I, we've gotten a lot of support for that actually, both um, you know, in person from people to just try and say, we get what you're trying to say here. And we have been in a pandemic for, you know, for some time. And um, it's great that we're hearing what's going on so we can make the, the decision we need to make for our family. Um, I just do not want to put the district in a, in a different kind of lens that says, you message this in a way that makes it seem like you're pushing masking. Um, I, I just don't think that's appropriate for the district to do at this time. And again, I have to wonder if we'd be able to bring that spike down knowing that everything else is open. And, and you know what happens if there's cohorts that are gonna be masking, there's still many that are not, they're still gathering, there's still sleepovers and play dates and like all that is still happening. We are not shut down. So that's just my two cents based on, you know, the observations through all this time. Thanks, Captain. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, I just want to take some time right now for the acknowledgement, acknowledgements for the um, retirees this year. Um, we have six faculty members retiring, um, some with a significant number of years of service. So I just want to give them um, a, a big thank you for their years of service. Pam Felber, who is our Mastway music education teacher, has been in the district and for 31 years, um, Kathleen Amadori, special education teacher at Mastway, has been in the district for 26 years. Whitney Burke, kindergarten teacher at Mastway, she's been in the district for 16 years. Susan Jackson, our middle school special education teacher for 12 years. Mary Beaton, the high school world language teacher, 22 years. And SD Ott, a special education teacher at the high school for 22 years. So I just want to thank them for all their service and acknowledge them. I just want to also thank uh, Pam Felber and Kathy Amaduri as over the years, as my kids went through Mastway. Um, Pam's been phenomenal with the music program over there. and. 
I remember, I don't know how many years ago it is now, we added on to the Mastway School and she got her own music room finally, rather than being a nomad around the school. She finally got a music room and she was so excited and she was so thankful to the board for, for adding that room, those rooms on, those four rooms. One of them being a music room, specially designed for music. So, and of course, Kathy Amadori has been incredible as far as working with special ed kids over there for as long as I can remember since I've been in the district and she's been... I'm just a huge fan of hers too, so it's sad to see them go. I wish them the best in retirement, but um, it's always tough to lose people like them. And I'm not saying they're any better than the other ones that are retiring, but uh, you know, anytime you lose people with a lot of experience, they're very, very tough to replace, and we will miss them. And we thank them for the service of the district. It will definitely be with regret. So. Yes, that's quite a legacy of service, and and uh, with gratitude, be. Wish them the best in all the adventures ahead. And we have a strategic plan update. Josh is going to update us about the technology. Good evening, everyone. Um, you should have a updated summary in your board packet uh, with a, a handful of notes and also a, a little summary I wrote up. Um, I believe the last time we did strategic plan updates was about a year ago, and a lot has happened in a year. <laughs> um, really the big focus this last year for us has been the new middle school, and it's open, which is fantastic, and uh, it's, it's a very technology-rich building, and it, things are working well. We, we opened very quickly and did not run into major issues, which is fantastic. We're still waiting on a few backorder items in the recital hall. Um, that's why you guys are still meeting here. Um, but overall, I, I, I feel like it, it went really well and we, I, Brian was on the weekly calls and there was uh, <laughs> there's quite a few times we didn't know if we'd have a network on day one or projectors on day one. So uh, it was really nice to have all those things. So really over the last year, it, it's, it's been the middle school and getting that open. Um, we, we, I was thinking back and last summer was really the first part where we first time we were we were actually able to go into the building and start working on the internals um, you know it was the the um, HVAC systems need to start talking to the Siemens controls and so we need cabling run we need a network working so um, a, a lot happened there and and then really the other um, piece um, we had on our strategic plan was to update our, our um, district firewalls uh, last I believe the the prior ones we purchased in 1314 um, so they they were they were due for replacement so those are those are really the big things that happened this last year um, along with uh, we didn't plan on it but dealing with with the pandemic um, as we've continued to deal with that and then really just looking ahead at this upcoming year um, for the um, new board members we're actually at the, this is the last year of our first um, go around with one-to-one -one. Um, when when the board chose to go one-to-one -one at the middle school that was four years ago we did a four-year lease and so uh, this is the end of, of that year so next year we need to get uh, new devices I think I'm coming back up to talk about that in a couple agenda items um, so that's going to be a, a big piece um, cyber security improvements are continuous uh, there was a lot of um, especially with with um, students and staff being remote during the pandemic um, schools became a huge target and cybersecurity is a really big topic uh, right now in k-12 and so we're we you know there's pieces we've been working on um, right along but there's also areas where we need to improve and and um, hopefully we can um, devote some time on, on making some good improvements there um, and and just you know making um, thoughtful improvements and not just you know um, kind of buying a product or you know making really good good improvements that help everyone and um, we've been talking about communications for quite a while and I, I believe we're getting close to website and notification updates um, so I'm anticipating that this upcoming year and then um, um, Sue Caswell has started the process on getting um, 
ADS Pro Fund, which is our accounting and payroll system updated and moving to, um, I believe it's ERP now, used to be Infinite Visions. Brian just went through it. ERP School Pro, I think they're, but still yeah, School Visions. ERP it's still, it's still something. Infinite Visions as far as yeah. everybody's concerned. So that's going to be a huge um, project uh, for Sue's team. Uh, we're involved as well as we have to migrate the data um, up to the new system. I believe the go-live date is January 1st to, to um, follow the um, tax season. So uh, a busy year ahead, uh, a busy year behind us, and a busy couple of years before that. So any um, questions you can answer? Sure. How have you found, as far as the, the first round of the one-on-ones that, you know, lease is coming up, were you pleased with what you ended up using um, for those devices? And yeah, I think overall it went well. We did run into, um, we, <laughs> we never got a confirmation, but we, we believe we found a manufacturer's defect, and I did find some other school districts with the same issue. Um, middle schoolers are a uh, special group and they are uh, rough with a lot of things and um, I think instead of having fancy machines that test how hinges work and bend them 10,000 times they should just give it to a middle schooler for a year and see what breaks first. So overall um, outside of that issue I feel like um, damage was fairly low. Where we started running into issues was the pandemic. We were out for so long that you know something broke, people weren't reporting it, and so by the time we got back in, there was just this huge influx of, of different issues. You know, maybe if we'd gotten to it sooner, it wouldn't have led to other issues. Um, we saw issues where the, the hinge wasn't working right, and eventually the screw came out, and now the side of the case has snapped off, and so it, it got worse. So, so I think most of our issues were just, it got worse because we weren't in person and could address them quickly, and then getting parts was really tough. Unfortunately, it, it's still fairly tough, um, but you know, if I, if I take those, those things out, the things that we really didn't have any control over, I thought things went really well. Um, um, later on, the quote that um, you guys have for the next round, we're sticking with Dell, and so this is two models newer than the ones that are up, and we've definitely seen areas, the areas where we had issues, they've been repaired in um, the second generation that we have at the high school, so they at least are fixing them going forward, but overall I thought they held up pretty good for our first go around and how quickly we moved, so. Yes. So who, how does tech support run when a student has a problem with their laptop? Who do they go to first? Yeah, typically um, in most of the, I would say in fifth through 12th grade, uh, let's, let's start at the middle school actually. The middle school, because their program has been around the longest, um, everyone knows to go to the library. Um, Nick Bellows in the library and his assistant, and I'm blanking on her name, is it Heather? Audrey, Audrey sorry. <laughs> um, Audrey, they're the first point of contact and they have a set of spares in the room so they can issue those out. Um, and then they work with us to get them fixed. So usually we'll run down at the end of the day, collect a stack and work through them. At the other buildings, it tends to be more the tech integrators because um, the high school uh, we've only been one-to-one -one at the high school for about two years now, and um, we've had some transitions in the library staff. Um, and Celeste Best, who's the tech integrator, appears just, she's been here for a while, and everyone knows Celeste. So she's usually the first point of contact, but we also have spares in the library here um, if she's teaching class because she still teaches um, part um, half time. So uh, library and tech integrator, and at the elementary schools, it's mostly the tech integrators. They also have a set of spares. And so that's how we've dealt with most of the issues. Um, if it's not something obvious, just swap the laptop out for the day and then, you know, if we have to order a part, make a repair, um, wipe it out, whatever, we usually deal with it separately. Is there a plan to sort of address that? Because the tech integrators aren't necessarily supposed to be frontline tech support, right? That's not, they're there to work on integrating technology and STEM into the curriculum. They're not necessarily there to run. My lap, my, my, 
kindergartner's iPad won't turn on kind of questions. Is there a plan to sort of work through that or is this um, now their new job description? I, I would say it just kind of happened during the pandemic um, just because we were so spread out and for such a long time we weren't in the buildings. Um, there's right now, or oh, we really don't have a plan to make any changes to that. It, 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 I would say internally it seems to be going well. I don't think it's a huge, um, they're, they're pretty good about um, telling us what they think. And um, I, I, I feel like it's going fairly well. Um, Caleb, who's running the meeting tonight, is at the elementary schools and he's usually in one of the buildings every day. So um, anytime there are issues that get, um, if it's busy or um, like right now, um, some of the folks are out, you know, he jumps in and helps out. Same at our other buildings. We do have a tech that's in this building all the time. So we help out when we can, but there is no plan right now. The tech integrators are wonderful at communicating with Josh and with me and if, if it, was a burden on their time or if they felt like they were in need of additional support, then they would let us know. We haven't heard that from them, but it's an ongoing conversation. That side of the process is an ongoing conversation. Yeah, because I know um, <clears throat> during the pandemic, and that's, this is, you know, during the pandemic, basically all the regular things the tech integrator was hired to do stopped. And I want to make sure that we get that balance back that they don't have to be the squeaky wheel saying, you know, like, I really want to get in the classrooms and do we do's and fun things, but <clears throat> I'm running, you know, four different classrooms are having iPad problems and they can't get to, you know, class link or whatever. And now I'm not doing what I really want to be doing. And so, it, you know, to me, it seems it's worth a conversation that isn't waiting for them to complain. Absolutely, we can do that. Is there still a district technology committee? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, uh, we have not met since pr before the pandemic. So um, I I'd like to say there is one, um, but I, I don't think it's a, I, I think Al was the yes. board rep on it. Yeah. So we probably don't have one established right now. But I think probably, the last you know. time we met was to talk about the learning management system and make a decision about Schoology, which was right before the pandemic. So, so that committee hasn't met since then. Yeah, looking at the one-to-one -one program and just thinking back to the strat plan side, mm -hmm. that is a, I think, a really interesting example of something that came out of a discussion about personal device use at the middle school, cell phone, student cell phone use at the middle school. And then was just very fortunate that that had a little bit of maturity to it before the pandemic happened. And you're able to use the learning from that to expand it over the rest of the district very, very quickly. So yep. um, that was auspicious. It's interesting to think about, well, what happens next? What's the next platform going to look like? I think that having the differentiation between the lower elementary and the rest of the district between iPads and, and laptops has made sense. but. You know, what, what comes next as technology evolves and how do we, how do we stay current um, you know, the next time we're looking at a huge new lease. <laughs> and then on the district policy and law part, um, are we currently engaged with a cybersecurity consultant or is that something you're looking to do? No, in the future? no. Um, we, we haven't hired anyone, um, but I do have um, a couple um, companies that I'm working on just getting some quotes from. Unfortunately, um, most companies, K-12 is a new arena for most companies and the pricing is really crazy. Mm -hmm. um, luckily, Primex is really trying to do some um, work, the district's risk management company around, because uh, they hold our cyber insurance. Um, or they insure us in those events. So they're doing a lot of work. They, they have a company out of Portsmouth um, that's been doing some assessments for schools at a, a much more reasonable rate. So just trying to find um, someone that isn't charging us essentially a full-time person. And so we're finally starting to see pricing come down that's manageable, so. Is that an area that you've been collaborating with other CIOs through your connections around the state? 
Yeah. So actually, one of the one of the folks um, that I've been talking to is a, a, another IT director, um, and he holds a bunch of security certifications. And so um, that was one of the thoughts was have someone who actually understands education instead of someone who's extremely business focused coming in and saying, well, why, why do you allow access to these things and not actually understand a learning environment? So uh, we do talk quite a bit. Um, we have a IT director group that is meeting monthly and cybersecurity is always a topic. Um, certain people have strengths in that and um, different people are working on different projects. Uh, one of our members is also a school board member, so she's on the um, um, New Hampshire School Boards Association board. And so we're kind of infiltrating all these groups to get everyone to start talking about cybersecurity more. Um, there's actually a really good um, um, testimony today for um, one of the congressional committees um, specifically talking about funding for cybersecurity in K-12 and healthcare at a federal government level and um, specifically through the E-rate program because it's a program that's already there and it makes sense. It's designed for internet technology and why wouldn't they fund, you know, use that mechanism to help fund cybersecurity. So it's, it's moving forward. Um, it's just such a new area. I think people don't quite understand what to do with us yet. But. And does that include backup and, and data security? Uh, yes, yeah, it, all those things. Um, you know, how quickly can we recover, prevention, mitigation, um, all those things. That's why I say some areas we've been doing for years, but you know, when you get into some of the, uh, I, I guess I would say newer for K-12, things like multi-factor authentication and things like that, those are things that are fairly new in education and I think we're trying to figure out what does that look like, you know, to require everybody, you know, require every teacher when they want to log in, pull out a phone, you know, what does that actually look like in a learning environment? So still working through that, <laughs> some yeah. of those things. And then the other part to that row is um, changes in law. So were there any changes in state law this year or, or federal regulations? Luckily, affected? it's pretty quiet right now. We haven't heard of any changes um, at the state level. Um, and I don't believe anything's coming down. Uh, well, I, I'd be more concerned about the state level. I don't think anything's happening federally. Um, but so far um, through um, New Hampshire School Administrators, we haven't heard any um, laws specifically. Um, we're still all kind of reeling from the last big one, uh, 19. So the around. privacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. House Bill sixteen twelve. Everyone knows it. No. <laughs> you so. see your eye twitching. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was. It's an interesting time, but it was a great opportunity for schools in New Hampshire to work together to come up with a solution. So it, it worked out to be good. But yeah, as far as I know, nothing's nothing's coming through right now. Other questions for Josh? We'll see you in a few minutes. All right. Thanks. All right. Business Administrator, Sue? Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to it in a minute. How about that? All right. Um, all right, then, uh, Student Representative Report, Olivia. Hi. Um, I just wanted to, again, like, thank and congratulate all the robotics teams that were able to come speak tonight. That was super cool to hear and see all the robots. Um, yeah, that was all super awesome. Um, I have a lot of important dates, a lot of new things, or a lot of old things from last week that got switched, so I got some new dates for you guys. Um, so the World Language Honor Society induction will now be May 24th, so next week. Um, underclassmen awards will now be May 31st. NHS induction will be June 2nd. Um, the Spring Fling, which is hosted by the Senate, is going to be on June 3rd. Um, the Senior Art Show is Wednesday, June 1st. Um, and Prom is Thursday the 26th, so next week. Very exciting. And then I have the full Senior Week schedule sort of thing. Is anybody interested in me going through that whole thing or just general things going on that week, I don't know. Go for it. Okay, so starting on that Monday, we got graduation practice, so super exciting. And then we're having our senior barbecue, and then there is a science showcase at 6 p.m. in the library and courtyard. Um, on Tuesday, we have graduation practice again. Um, senior scholarship awards will be in the auditorium, um, and 
senior awards will also be in the uh, auditorium and like chords and stuff. Yes. <laughs> um, and then on Wednesday uh, at 9.45 is the senior trip to Fort Foster. Um, and then we'll be back at Oyster River by 2.15 um, and have pizza, water, freeze pops, that sort of thing. Um, RSVPs were sent out today during advisory. I got to go deliver some letters to all the advisors and their students that had their nice little invitation to the senior banquet, which I'll go over in a minute because that's a little confusing, but it's not that confusing. Um, and yes, they're very well done. Miss um, Johnson helped, uh, she designed the um, in invites and I think they're really well put together and they came out really cute. We like printed them on cardstock and they had like nice little leaves and stuff. I should have brought it so I could show you guys, but I forgot. Um, and then on Thursday, we have graduation practice again. And... Um, all your stuff has to be turned in and ready to go and you'll receive your cap and gown and then at 10 will be the senior walk at Oyster River Middle School in Barrington Middle School if you went there and um, at 530 is going to be the senior banquet at the regatta room in Elliott, Maine and that you also have to RSVP for which there was a QR code in the um, envelope that you received with your invite and stuff that you RSVP'd for the uh, senior class trip and the banquet sort of thing. The banquet is like a semi-formal, um, just for students, not like a family event. I know I had a lot of questions. People were asking me about that. Um, and it's like going to be like a dinner. There's going to be like music and stuff. It's like semi-formal, so kind of like a fun like end of the year get together for the class sort of thing. Um, and then the final days of classes for seniors is the June uh, 2nd and 3rd, and that's when you would have your final sort of thing. Um, and then student elections are also coming up. That was a lot. Do you guys have any questions? Do you want to talk about graduation? What day it is? And oh, yes. Graduation is June 10th. I forgot that one, but yes. And then the rain date is that following Saturday. Um, I know we're still going back and forth on the times. Did we decide yet? We're waiting for senior Okay, yes, so we're waiting. There's a few times thrown out for when that would be, but, yep. Oh, if it were to rain on graduation and we had uh, the rain date, um, project graduation would still be that Friday night. Yes, okay. <laughs> All right. Sprint to the finish, huh? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, the unanimous consent agenda has only the nominations, teacher nominations for next year. Anybody? Fin did? Finance committee, did you? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no report. We didn't meet. We'll meet again uh, next, next week. Next week, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Denise. Um, so we have two nominations in the unanimous consent agenda. Does anybody want to discuss those separately? All right, so then I will move approval of the unanimous consent agenda, which is um, approval of nominations for Robert Pavlik and Sarah Farwell for teaching positions for the 2022-23 school year. Second from Brian. All those in favor? Six in favor and the student rep in favor. Those are approved. All right, now discussion and action items. So let's start with the laptop lease, Josh. Hello again. Um, I, I think I explained it uh, <laughs> a couple minutes ago, but uh, we need to replace the devices at the middle school. And also during the pandemic, we did expand our one-to-one -one program into the elementary school. And so when we um, purchased the devices for the middle school, we had purchased carts at the time for the elementary school. So um, I'm trying to get um, about two grade levels into this lease as well, and then have the other two grade levels on the um, high school lease um, that's about halfway through. And then the other group that um, we um, also feel we need to get devices for was the paraeducators, um, since they're working with the kids and historically we have not um, 
provided them laptops. During the pandemic, we, we found every working machine we could, and um, so they have had devices um, during the pandemic up till now, um, but they're, they're getting a little rough. So, so that's why the, the count is much more than the middle school. Um, it's because we're trying to um, start working in the elementary school, um, paraeducators, um, middle school, elementary school, and the paraeducators, yes. <laughs> What will happen with all the devices being retired? So they are on a dollar buyout lease. Or the lease is a dollar buyout. So we're gonna buy them out for a dollar um, and we're gonna keep the ones that are in decent shape to use as spares throughout the district um, as long as we can. Um, uh, I'm the, what I'm being told is that production is not great right now. So um, I am a little concerned about you know how quickly we'll get these. So right now the plan is to hold on to them, uh, the ones that we are coming off lease, clean them up as best we can just in case. Right now the ETA is six weeks, um, but that's changing I think probably daily at this point. So we'll we'll get through that hurdle and then and then see what's there. Um, if there's an opportunity to sell them, we might investigate that. But um, four-year-old devices I don't think are going to fetch too much money. But right now the plan is to hold them. Brian? We'll make a motion to accept the, uh, the laptop lease as presented by Josh. A motion from I'll second. Brian, a second from Denise. Further discussion? What was budgeted for this? Um, I'm trying to think. I got it as close to what I had budgeted as possible. Okay. Um, so I believe I had um, just right at 180. Okay. All right, other discussion? All those in favor of laptop lease? Six in favor and the student rep in favor of laptop lease is approved. All right, thank Thanks, you. Josh. Thank you. Josh, do you wanna go ahead and do Oyster River Care while you're here? Yeah. Uh, or? Sure. Uh, I can. Or actually, that's a policy thing, isn't it? Yeah. It, it's a policy and that's just the procedure that it, and it's just a draft procedure. Um, it hasn't, you know, it, it hasn't gone through, um, you know, revisions. Certainly we, we did discuss it at uh, policy committee enough that we wanted to come forward with the actual policy with the understanding that the, um, the procedure is still being worked on. Okay. Um, do you want to, Denise? Do you want to do you want to just hold on that until we get to the policy section? Then. Okay. Yeah, I mean. Uh... All right. Then we've got the school bus lease. Good evening. This is actually the school bus bid, and I apologize. You had the lease document in your agenda. I put the bid results in your folder. I don't know if you happen to see that. So do we need to do both or? Yes, we do. So I just wanted to go over it. We have two bids, DATCO and WC Cressy. Um, just to note that price is about 9% higher than it was last year. And also note the delivery date on both of those. It's out about three months longer than it usually is. So, so Lisa is recommending we go with WC Cressy. That is the drivers prefer that bus. Um, so yes, I do need a motion to um, accept um, WC Cressy um, for the two buses for this year's lease. A motion to accept the uh, bid from W.C. Cressy. Denise? I'll second. So this is, are we, are we voting on both the contract and the financing? So the financing, the financing will come later, but I wanted you to see the financing details. You, okay. You, I will tell you, too, that that interest rate is up about 2%. It was 3.5, so we're seeing the, right. the difference there. But we do have money in the budget to support that five-year lease for two buses. Discussion, questions? All those in favor of the bus contract? Six in favor and the student rep in favor. Thank you. Um, we have operating plan discussion for 22-23. I think that we wrapped that up last time. I don't think there's anything to add there. Sorry about that. Um, and then the next item is board goals for 22-23. So we. We introduced this, this topic last week. We had our last, our last previous meeting, we had our last section of the strategic plan update. 
this afternoon, this evening with, with the technology section with Josh. Um, so where we're at is, I think we're ready to start um, discussing what items we'd like to see in the board goals for next year and then, and then putting those into you know, a more detailed written form so that we can actually uh, debate and, and approve those in one of the next couple meetings. So, uh, Denise. Um, not sure how we're going to proceed if we're just going to sort of jump in with topic ideas. Um, I know that I would like to definitely have something where we're hiring a DEIJ coordinator. I would definitely like to see as a goal to um, somehow, you know, look at the impact of that position or, you know, again, I'm not exactly sure of the wording, but I just think it is important to include where it's a new position um, and we want to see how it's working. Um, so yeah, I think that should be um, included in our board goal in some way. Yeah, so so, so I mean, I'll back up just a second. Um, so when we've done things like this in the past, what has seemed to work well is to go around, go around the table, and uh, you know, each of us have a chance to provide some input, and then we kind of uh, see if there are common themes that come out of that that we then can can build on. So yeah, so thank you for kicking that off. Michael, could I ask a question first? You shared um, the goals from uh, 1920 and 1819, which was really helpful. Um, some of the goals are specifically what board members individually or together um, could do, and some seem to be, so communication, for example, um, uh, goals for the administration to primarily drive. How should we be thinking about board goals for this year? So my opinion is that these should be things that the board takes on and collaborates with the administration to, to advance. So these are not, that these should not be just things that we're saying, hey, superintendent and administrative staff and, and teachers and staff, go do these things. These are things that re require some level of input and collaboration with, with the board. But really, um, and ideally would, would align with our strategic plan and um, hopefully things that are supported in, in the budget. But you know, this is at the discretion of, of the board. So it doesn't, we still have the strategic plan that we're managing too, um, and these would be things that are deeper emphasis within the plan or perhaps not articulated in the plan? It could be either one, yeah. yeah. So do you want to go around this way? Olivia, do you want to share anything with regards to goals for next year, knowing that you're not going to be here, but <laughs> things you've seen that we should be thinking about? Um, trying to think. Um, the only thing that I like off the top of my head, um, it's not anything we've really discussed too much this year, but it's just like what the future of like the French program at the high school will look at, like, because what I've been seeing is that there's been such a decline in numbers, mostly I think there's a lot of factors coming from that, like um, a lot of students are choosing different languages in middle school, which is fine and stuff, but I'm just curious at like why that could be or something like that. So that might just be something to look into because I feel like it keeps getting kind of like, not brushed over, but I don't know. And we have like two amazing French teachers that I feel like, I don't know, I've heard some like things like from um, like teachers about their sadness and the lack of numbers in the program and sort of thing. But just because it's something close to my heart. But that's the only thing I can think of right off the top of my head right now. But Thank you. Yeah. Uh, kind of like along the lines of what Denise was saying is being able to measure year over year right now what we generally do, and it's kind of the easiest and go-to is we look at scoring, you know, how people score on their, on their testing. I'd like to see that expanded to um, include maybe how students feel or um, different effects that they have on the district, you know, the programs that we have. Whether it's a position or it's a program, really doesn't really matter. But um, I just kind of want to see, look at some different aspects of how we um, evaluate at the end of the year. Not evaluate the person, but evaluate the program. Um, you know, whether it's to see whether it's successful or not, but we can say, hey, you know, 
all right, we increased um, you know math scores by 10 percent, but the students are miserable because they have four hours of homework a night. You know, I mean, that's there's different aspects of it. I just uh, something off the top of my head, but uh, that's something I'd kind of like to see uh, us have as a goal, at least to have a different um, look at things through a different lens than we have in the past. Mm -hmm. Maybe just as a, just to change it up a little bit and see, you know. Uh, what else? Obviously, we always fall back on scores because that's the easiest measurement, but just expand it a little more if we could. Uh, the things that pop into my head are the world language at the elementary school, starting that discussion or continuing that discussion. Um, we've been hearing about the competency-based grading, and I know that that's a big, giant subject, so to drill down on that, I think that for me, I'd like to talk more about that four to five and nine, uh, eight to nine transition, so the transition between schools. And then I think we just need to look at when we do have our list of goals is setting them in a priority order. And maybe that could be a goal is what's the priorities? Prioritization. Prioritization of the goals, right? Instead of just a list, have it be. Heather? Um, so it's not fully formed yet, but really thinking about curriculum, we've been talking about the competency based education and the grading. We've talked about how we bring in the DEIJ coordinator and how that adds to our curriculum. We have the sustainability committee and sustainability folks at each of the schools that are working on bringing that in. We have STEM and tech integrators at every school and looking at how they bring STEM and tech integration in. We have the competencies, we have the standards under the competencies. We have standardizing across this each grade as well as vertically standardizing between expectations, grading, and what competencies and standards should look like across the district. And so <clears throat> that's a huge list. So I, my thought is twofold, you know, we want to find that balance of we can walk and chew gum at the same time, but we are running dangerously close to, we're trying to do a lot of things, we're doing nothing well. Um, so I'm going to echo Matt's, we really need to prioritize, prioritize, mm -hmm. okay, you know what I mean? What we are looking to do, and we need to think about chunking it down, and so my, it's, it's not really a goal yet. It'll get there in probably three days. I'm just thinking about curriculum, how we balance that with personnel, and how we plan that out for what we want to do. One of the benefits of not being the first is that you hear a lot of um, similarities with what is on your list. Um, Connecting to the DEIJ and, and sustainability work, um, I think as understanding what that, that vertical and horizontal alignment looks like with, the, with DEIJ, with sustainability, with, with SEL. Um, Suzanne, it's, uh, uh, the, it, you had, like, th this first year has been so much getting under, just under the, the belt, and, and you'll have additional capacity, um, which is really exciting for, um, for what that looks like. Um, I think that the um, capstone program and the experiential and real world learning that John Donnelly has, has worked forward would love to see a way to um, provide support to that and connected to what Matt and Heather have said about um, competency-based education, Heather's question about teacher capacity and just what we, we heard where there is um, you know, real desire and expertise um, to, to move this uh, forward. Um, as a board goal, how do we allow for our teachers to have the time and resources to, um, to to advance our, our instruction, um, particularly after such a tiring few years. Um, two more, getting out ahead of Dr. Morse's transition and starting to think about just having a timeline for identifying um, the skills, qualifications, approaches that we will need for that. And finally, um, 
kind of connected to what Ryan was saying. Um, looking further at risk behavior and um, in our district, uh, returning to the conversation that we started around the, um, the position at the high school that we weren't able to fund this year, the LADAC, the LADAC um, and just understanding a little bit more um, about s some of the, uh, the risk behavior that we d don't spend as much time on, I, I think, in our, our discussions, but that we might be able to learn more about and support our children better. Um, I think most of the areas have been addressed. I think the CBE in world language, DEIJ, um, and along with the CBE, the curriculum instruction and assessment and time for faculty for uh, professional development and, um, and engaging in that conversation. And Michael, I didn't mention communications just because there seems to be a lot of momentum there, but if we should have it on the list just so we don't forget about it, mm -hmm. we can do that. So we, we definitely should have it on the list. I was going to add it since nobody else had said it until now. Um, I, I think that, so I, I hope that everybody was contacted by Wendy. We have a, a workshop planned for um, June 8th with, with Amy Sterndale, and I think that probably will be kind of that coming out of that, the, the tone and direction for what our goals ought to be for next year and ground communications will be uh, a little bit more clear at that point. Um, and then and then I think the other big one for this year uh, that should be right at the top of the list is planning for the superintendent search, not just the timeline, but what is the strategy going to be for that? If we're going to use a firm, who do we engage? Um, how do we want to see that process go through? So We also, yeah. also have to look at business administrator. Mm -hmm. As well, yes, and that's, is that that's, us or is that Jim yeah. that hires the business administrator? So that's not really anything that's on our would be on our. It's Jim. That would not be our, our goals, right? That would, that would be, be it's it's a it's an administrative position that the superintendent owns the right. Okay. The search process that the board would advise and then and then have to approve, but um, okay. approve the contract. But okay, uh, that's fine. I yeah. just wanted to make sure that that was somewhere on there. And. Michael, just to follow up on, it is our intent to hire a firm to assist with the superintendent search? We have not said that. Okay. That is a question that it, I think question. we should answer in the 22-23 school year so that we are not trying to answer that when we are trying to do a search. Okay. And certainly there are options between local, regional, and national search, you know, for-profit, non-profit, um, options should we choose to go that way. And of course costs associated with those. So, um, so then, so we've gone around once, I uh, want to open up for further discussion. I'll observe that um, I think that competency-based learning and reporting, um, our DEIJ work, world language, um, and curriculum, although curriculum, I would say, my notes were a little bit more nebulous on exactly where, that, that didn't coalesce in my mind. But those are the areas that I heard the most, um, most comments and interest in, I think. So. Denise, did you fully share your list? Um, I think it might, everything else was covered, um, so I'm, I'm fine. I, I agree with, you know, the, the things that, I think as far as the curriculum, I, I I mean, obviously, there's sort of a piece of that in world language. I mean, there's some overlap there, but in terms of looking specifically at things like, you know, the time that we allow for professional development and things like that, certainly that could kind of stand as its own goal, potentially. I would agree with that. I agree with that, okay, yeah. So, um, so I guess the question now is, where do we want to go from here? Do we want to ask certain members to draft something up? Do we want to have some more discussion at the next meeting about what, what goes into these in terms of the, the content of what the goal actually becomes? Um, do you want me to just write something up, which is probably not the best idea? But, uh, 
based on how the conversation has gone so far. So we have something more concrete to to uh, discuss before we finalize these. What did you do? What did you do with these examples that you sent us? How did those ones come out? What, what do you mean? What did we do with them? How, what was Which that process? process? Yeah. Uh, um, what was our we, we vote for Dan to do all the work? Is, the, is it the process today? <laughs> I, did Tom write? I, I'm trying to remember who like who actually wrote wrote them up. That I don't remember. That I don't remember. I do not remember. Do you remember, Brian? I, I, it's a distant memory. <laughs> it was pre-COVID, wasn't it? It was pre-COVID. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why there's a whole there's a whole year. Two years missing, right? This, so we have we have 1920 was the last year we did. Yep. Yeah. Um, well, let's do that. So, so I'd, I'd like to come out of today at least with what we think the themes are, so that we can start to start to um, narrow those down into some more definitions. So. Uh, so what I tossed out was diversity, equity, inclusion, justice. And I think there are several themes there that could, could crystallize around, um, around program integration, around evaluation uh, of what we're doing, around partnership with coordinator. Should we go ahead with that position? Um, so that's, that's one area. There's the world language, and there are definitely different different dimensions to that. I think a lot of the discussion recently has been around the elementary end of that, but I think that Olivia raises a good point with this is a this is a K-12 continuum, and what we do in one place definitely affects what happens in another place, as we heard from the robotics teams earlier today. Um, Competency-based grading and reporting. Curriculum, although I would definitely need some help to, to refine down what we mean by that. Uh, superintendent transition and communications. So, I guess I would say with th those are six themes that I heard. We agree with those. Are those the right categories, or is there something missing there? We what would the process be? You work those themes into our because you've mapped out kind of our future meetings. Would those themes be put into those agendas, or how do you see? How do you foresee? That coming to fruition. Yeah, I, I think I think where we're at right now, we probably need to have a little bit of dedicated discussion about each one of those themes in order to get start to get some definition, and then ask somebody to write something down to, to mm -hmm. propose propose language so that we can actually say yes or no, we agree with this or don't agree with this. And if it gets too lengthy, we may have to go into a workshop or something like that because could, yeah. some of those can be deeper than others. Y yes, be way longer yeah. than some of them. You could probably do in ten minutes, and other ones you can. Right, you can do it an hour, right, or longer. Yeah. So, well, and we and we could even we could even start with uh, if we feel some of these like um, the superintendent transition. If we if we feel that that's clear enough to ask one of us to go ahead and take a stab at that for our next meeting, we could do that. Uh, I, I I think as far as a goal for that one, it's to me the goal would be to develop a, a timeline and process for the superintendent search. I think that would be the goal. You know, what, what process are we going to use in terms of search and, and to develop a timeline that we would want to, yeah. you know, if we're going to hire a search, you know, when would that happen, that sort of thing, just to kind of lay it out. That may be something, though, you might want to have a small committee mm -hmm. just to lay that groundwork rather than do it all, all of us together. It's, it's going to be too, you know, it's just not going to be as efficient. But if we can say, all right, let's out this timeline, bring it to the board and say, this is what we're thinking. Kind of like we do a finance committee. You know, we yeah, kind of yeah. kind of get through all the weeds and say, all right, this is, these are options, and just kind of make it more efficient rather than spend hours, because we could spend hours discussing that. Yeah, so yeah. maybe the goal is to appoint a subcommittee of the board to develop a process and timeline for the superintendent search. Could the subcommittee have part of the administration team? Yeah. As well. 
However, so I don't think the board is going to want to set up process and timeline in a black hole without well, some of those it, folks. This that would one be is unique because committee. it really is our. It really is our hire. We should, they, yeah. Yeah. It works for us. So it's their only employee that we actually have an employee. So it is kind of a. I understand they, wanna, that they will it, be it involved. In the, search, they will most definitely be involved in the process. But as far as the setting up of the process, that really is a, more of a board function. Correct. From a, yes, absolutely. That's absolutely correct. We can we can of course invite anybody that we want to participate in that subcommittee work to participate in that committee work. Mm -hmm. um, I, we would probably even as whoever it is would probably even ask for advice from other people that have been through it. We, we and well. there are there are resources from yeah. yes that's certainly true. So the right. the school boards association is a resource for some of these things. Um, yeah. NASDAQ is a resource for this sort of thing. So yeah, uh, yeah there are. And, and I think the committee would probably, if we, if we went that route with a subcommittee, that would be the group to go tap into some of those sources. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure if it, it, it's helpful it's in thinking about all these different categories, um, different goals. A way that made sense to organize it for me is there's this huge bucket of staff capacity um, and that allows us to move ahead with the you know the vertical and horizontal integration it allows us to get um, further with competency based education including the transitions that are so important between levels um, it allows us to go deep into that vision of a graduate and the the four year I, you know I call it a capstone but I think we're, we're thinking of it at the high school level as um, as how a student can progress to have a richer experience a, a, Across all those four years, leading to um, to uh, you know to uh, applied work, um, and it, there's great momentum uh, in those areas, uh, and we just need to be sure that they're they're resourced appropriately. Um, a second category is around students, and um, you know, to Brian's uh, point about like what other metrics should we be looking at. Um, what I was saying about uh, what we know about risk behavior and, and student needs. I think we've we've um, spent a lot of time this year on, on MTSS and uh, would love to go a little bit deeper into um, special ed or more advanced students or just sort of understanding the student needs. Um, and also in that category is a part of the DEIJ evaluation. Um, I didn't mean to expand beyond the original goals, but you know that sense of, of how of really um, some of the goals that we mentioned fall in that understanding of the, the student need and addressing those. And then finally, there's a third category of just like the, the structure, structural decisions we need to make around world language and uh, effects on elementary school, or sort of how those are connected. The um, superintendent search, the communications, those are sort of just um, marching down to get information and make decisions and uh, it's more process based perhaps than the other two. For what that's worth uh, when you write it up. Well, right, right. So, so yeah, any of these could have any of those dimensions, you know, right. an, an education component for the board for us or understand, kind of common understanding and certainly a, an analysis or action component to it as well. Um, I think what I'd like to suggest is that there's a couple of these where I think we can probably work with with you, Suzanne, and, and Jim, when he's back, to bring in some of what's in the strategic plan. And so in terms of world language and competency-based education, I think that makes sense. And we can probably bring in, um, start, to, start to put together a proposal based on the strat plan. I think that we outlined a framework for the superintendent search goal. Um, so those three, I think we could bring in some more specific language to start to consider for the next meeting. The DEIJ curriculum and communications, I don't feel like I heard as much concrete yet in this discussion tonight. 
well, I kind of propose, and I guess what I was just thinking is is really simple. It doesn't really because I feel like the work, a lot of the work, is actually going to go with the coordinator and administration in terms of you know. But for us, maybe just to keep informed. You know, I guess I was thinking of more of that piece of it to make sure that we are, you know, maybe getting regular updates as far as the work and the direction that it's going and perhaps, you know, something around how will we know it's it's successful, you know, uh, that position, you know, so sort of somewhat of an evaluation component, I think is what I had in my mind. It, not so much that we're going to be doing this work, I mean, we are within, for example, the DEIJ committee will still be meeting. But I really had it in my mind just to make sure that the board was informed and that we continued to get updates in terms of the direction that that position was going. So maybe it's just as simple as that. I don't know. If we can, if, if other folks have some thoughts on what the DEIJ goal for the board would look like, we can also start to bring that into some more concrete form for the next meeting. Mm -hmm. That would be where you talk about if you have thoughts. So maybe people could just think about wording and, and you know, people could bring suggestions like for, for wording okay. for any of these goals, oh, yeah. really. I mean, we could almost do it that way if people wanted to take some time and really think about the wording for these different goals and we yeah. could take a look at that. So we have six themes and six people. Just well, saying. Seven, Dan. So you, you went from assigning everything to Dan because he wasn't here. <laughs> to giving Dan nothing for next week. To getting week. him completely yeah, next off the hook. <laughs> Michael, I don't know the communications no. goal. I, I don't know if it would be impacted by the workshop. I, I really think we will probably have a lot of direction that comes out of that. Yeah. Okay. I think similarly for DEIJ, having the coordinator on board will um, uh, accelerate how we are setting goals for the year and um, how those would relate to the board. I do think that the K-12 vertical integration is, um, is something that we should focus on. And I think, you know, Al brought up the point about DEIJ. We talk about it a lot, but we don't have a sort of shared understanding um, as a board um, th through, you know, additional. He he mentioned a workshop. You know, I think it's worth thinking about um, whether this is something that we sort of should spend a bit more more time ourselves. Um, understanding and, and understanding how we work with each other um, or whether we can keep it at arm's length and just continue to uh, to ensure it's resourced appropriately at the administrative level. All right. So if it's okay with the board, um, Suzanne and I will take this and, and we'll, we'll continue the discussion at the next meeting but with, with a little bit more structure to it. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Um, the next item, uh, Suzanne, do you want to take introduce this one? Request to honorize, <laughs> uh, geez, request to recognize ORCSD nurses with an honorarium. Sure. So in your packet, you'll see a memo from Jim. Um, at the last board meeting, our nurses were recognized for their hours of work um, and dedication to the district during the COVID-19 pandemic. There have been many schools who have given honorariums to their nurses or additional monies throughout um, the pandemic. And so in this memo, you see that the, um, unfortunately uh, the Oyster River District didn't receive the same federal funds as others. And so that's one of the reasons why um, the nurses were not compensated. And he is recommending that the nurses have an honorarium for their work during the pandemic and the hours that they put in in addition to their school hours. I have two questions on that. Sure. Um, so is it, is it the fact that 
uh, nurses were paid a salary just like um, other um, other employees were did not get any additional compensation Correct. for the additional hours they worked. And would you say so? Everyone worked more <laughs> during um, during COVID. It's, I think the teachers in, in, in particular, um, uh, and yet it seems like there is. Um, um, a, a, even a, a difference beyond that for what the nurses um, did, and I, I just wanted to be sure that that, that is the sort of that difference is widely recognized. Um, I think because uh, Catherine's coming to the podium, I think that because it was a, a health crisis, we did lean on our nurses in a very different kind of capacity than what their job typically is, um, and we expected uh, something not necessarily more, but. Well, definitely more, but also something very different than them, what they're used to in their positions. Yeah, and to piggyback on that is, remember, our nurses have been on call since it started, so they've been available every single evening, every single weekend. There are still weekends that they're working through, um, you know, working through cases with families. They're contacting families so that they have information prior to entering school on Monday. Uh, they're following up after all the SAS testing. So they are working um, in the evening hours and on the weekends, and they have not once asked yeah. to be recognized for that, um, but they need to be recognized for it. So what was different the first year of the pandemic is, you're right, everyone was working um, overtime because we had kids who were remote. We were in school, we were out of school, like we were running hybrid programs, like we were doing lots of different things. Um, and then going into this year is stuff in the school, even though we're kind of, you know, chasing our tails right now, things started to settle down just in terms of how we're providing an education for students. And so everyone is still working, um, you know, terribly hard within the schools, but our nurses have not stopped working those evenings and weekends, um, which looks a little different than a typical kind of school year. So it's hard to not recognize the additional time and they, I see their emails to staff. They are very open to receiving them because they do want to make sure they can do the best they can to keep the schools safe and provide information to families and staff as quick as they can. Thank you. Yeah. Please. I'd like to make a motion um, to pay um, each nurse a $5,000 honorarium for their efforts to keep our schools safe. Brian? There. Brian seconds that for the discussion. How much does it cost and we have the budget for it? $35,000. And yes. It's in the general, yes. we have enough money in the general fund. So this is, you know, this amount is really symbolic. Um, it's on par with what we would, what, the, the stipend for a, a large activity or for a, a major sports season. And this has been going on for a lot more than a major sports season. So mm -hmm. I'm very it's very tough to put a measurement on what they've right what they've done for the district over the last couple of years and then some. So, I mean, this is the very least we can do. If I could do more, I would, but, you know, besides what we did last last meeting and this, I think it's a nice gesture at least to show our appreciation. Okay. Further discussion? All those in favor of the NRM for the nurses? Six in favor and the student rep in favor. It's approved. Thank you. All right. Um, we have, what we have left is uh, policies, mm -hmm. committee updates, public comment, and then a non-public session. Do we want to just continue on up to the non-public session before we break? Okay. So policy, Denise? Um, yes. So uh, we have three policies um, for first read. We've got our transgender and gender expression, which is JBAB our distance education, which is IMBA, and then care of school property, JFCB. Um, we, the gender, the transgender and gender expression policy um, initially went through the DEIJ committee and then uh, was taken up by a subcommittee of two faculty members and a student that also met with Dr. Morse. Um, to refine some of the ideas that came out of the DEIJ committee work. Um, and then that was brought to policy committee. And so we met um, last week and what reviewed it. Um, so what you have in front of you is what we came up with for that. 
um, it was we felt that it was definitely time to update this policy. Um, you know, it was the first of its kind in the state, and but you know, knowledge has increased, and we definitely felt like it needed updating. Um, so I don't know if people want to look at each policy individually or kind of take a distance education. Uh, we brought that to our policy committee a number of times and went back and forth. Uh, it was looked at by Suzanne and um, ELO coordinator and uh, lots of different folks, counselors, you know, went through s many revisions. I don't think you have all the six different colors that we, uh, we ended up with on our uh, version that we had in front of our policy committee, but that's the, uh, what we came up with that's in front of you. And then the last one, the care school property is, um, the one that has the um, uh, procedure that was talked about earlier with uh, Josh in terms of the um, technology piece. That's the procedure that goes with the policy. And the policy was just basically updated because um, it needed to include, you know, it, I mean, the policy itself isn't really changing. We changed one word in it, but it was important to, update the um, the procedure that goes along with it to include the tech devices that the students now have now that we have one on one so anyway that's kind of a summary and questions and comments about any of them on the distance education policy um, the, the opening paragraph talks about the school board encouraging students to take full advantage of distance education opportunities after that, most of it seems to be primarily high school oriented. Is this a policy that's targeted specifically at the high school or at all levels? Um, it could be all it could be all levels. Certainly middle school students do take distance education courses as well. Middle school students, we have um, <clears throat> middle school students who participate in VLACs. They aren't necessarily for credit, but they do participate in VLACs to um, for a variety of different reasons. There is a, a bit of a disconnect perhaps that we encourage students to take full advantage of these courses and then it very much reads like you're on your own. There's no more um, local supervision, which is fine, but it, you know, you, you're basically, if you choose to, to go through this avenue for credit, particularly at the high school level, level when you're looking at credit for graduation, you are in charge of making sure that you that the course meets it and that you are receiving a grade worthy of graduating with it. So and there is a process at the high school level um, for ensuring that the student is choosing a course that would meet those credits so they would meet with the ELO coordinator. There's a process that they go through um, and then it would go through uh, the counselor also. So there is some work that's done ahead of time with the student. As far as VLAX is concerned, we aren't able to, it is um, because because of the way that VLAX works, the school district is not able to go in and to see how the student is progressing, what they're doing. So we we have our ELO coordinator monitoring that the best that they can, um, but it's not something, that's something that the student and the family does on their own with VLAX. We do, there are a lot of times at the high school level where students will be provided space and support for those classes. So perhaps someone is taking an algebra class through VLAX, then they can absolutely access the lab and the math lab and work in the math lab. So there are opportunities for those supports for students. Um, there's a reference in the distance education policy towards the end in a short paragraph to policy IJNDB. Oh, IJNDB, yes. That is not listed in the references, Good and question. I don't see it mm -hmm. on our website. Does that policy actually exist? It's probably mislabeled, would be my guess. So we do, I'm, I would assume. 
It's usually four letters. Yeah, it should yeah. have four, right? So it's probably just, we can definitely check into that and see which policy should actually be referenced. And then do we want to talk, so, so, so on, in terms of the, the uh, care of school property, the, there's also the care or, or CSD care program. There's a soft copy in the packet. There's a hard copy here. Are they a little bit different? They and, are. And this is for information as to where um, we're proposing to go, but that is not ready for approval at this point. Is that yeah, right? we don't we don't approve. It's it's a little confusing because the board does not approve the procedure, mm -hmm. but sometimes when there's significant procedure behind a policy, we provide it for informational purposes so that the board can see sort of, well, why do we even have this policy that's, you know, whatever, two sentences. And, um, you know, it's just kind of informational. So we, we don't approve the procedure. The procedure itself needs to have a policy that it kind of operates under. And so that's what the policy, that's why the policy is so thin. Um, so if, if people don't have questions, I can certainly um, make a motion um, to accept, you know, for all of them together as a block, or if people wanted to talk about any of them individually, any other. Them all together. What's that? Do, do all okay. All, okay. all right. So I'll uh, like to make a motion to for policy JBAB transgender and uh, transgender and gender expression. IMBA distance education and JFCB care of school property for first read. We have a motion from Denise and a second from Brian, and we'll we'll fix that policy reference before. Yeah, we, get we to definitely that will. I've got a note. Yeah, yeah, I've got a note to check into it. Discussion. All those in favor of those policies for first read. Six in favor, and the student rep in favor of those are approved. All right. Are there committee updates? The DEIJ committee was invited to meet with the two finalists for the DEIJ coordinator position, Rachel Blansett and Lou Farrell, um, along with the um, community last Monday and Wednesday. I want to thank everyone from the community who, who turned out and to the candidates who had really long days um, before that dinner meeting, meeting with staff and students and administration, Suzanne, <laughs> more than that. Yep, they had a full day. They um, arrived around 10 o'clock and finished around 7 o'clock in the evening. Um, and they did, they met with um, administration at every building. They had tours and met with faculty. They met with uh, students, high school students, and had lunch. Um, and then went on to meet with the community. And next steps, Dr. Morris is, a, is away, but we'll come back to piles of feedback from each of the, the stakeholders and we'll um, determine next steps, which could include making a nomination to the board. Other committee updates? All right, public comment? Um, closing actions, we have our next meeting on June 1st. There is going to be a communications workshop right here in the library on June 8th at 7 p.m. So that's not on there, but please add that for your reference. And then, and then June 15th, and that will round out the fiscal year. Uh, so with that, I will move that we go into non-public session under New Hampshire RSA 91A, uh, subchapter three, paragraph two, subparagraph C, um, matters which, if discussed in public, would likely affect adversely the reputation of any person other than a member of the public body itself. Second. We have a second from Brian. This requires a roll call vote. Heather Smith, yes. UC Terrell, yes. Michael Williams, yes. Denise Day, yes. Uh, Brian Cisneros, yes. Matthew Bacon, yes. All right, so we'll begin non public. Thank you.